It's a hot day in late June. We're in Bryan, Texas, a city right in the middle of the triangle that's formed by Houston, Dallas, and Austin. And my producer Sarah and I are watching a man named Don McElroy unfold a huge piece of paper. Okay. This is a chart you used to be good at. Okay. Biochemical pathways from Roche. Wow. Okay, you... it's 27 square feet. Okay. Okay, do you see how fine that is? You still have to get up super close to read it. Mm-hmm. Okay, for instance, if you go to this little section here, this is blood clotting. Here's all of these... Don McElroy is a dentist by trade. He was also a member of the Texas State Board of Education from 1998 until 2011, which is why we ended up in his dental office, listening to him explain one of his favorite topics, the flaws in the theory of evolution. But you can see how 27 square feet of these biochemical pathways, and guess how many explanations you can get from an evolutionist on how it happened. Oh, you don't get that one. <laughs> Don is a tornado of a person. He tends to talk in one long run-on sentence. He teaches fourth grade Sunday school, and it shows. He has a distinctly elementary school teacher vibe. Like, he would ask us a question and then immediately feed us the answer. Guess how many explanations they have. How many? It, to explain the evolution, how that happened. Zero! There must be thousands and thousands and thousands Complex, they have no evidence. Don is also a young Earth creationist. He believes that Earth was created by God, our planet is about 6,000 years old, and that at one point, people and dinosaurs lived on the Earth together. As you might be able to tell, Don has spent decades of his life trying to convince people that the theory of evolution is wrong. In fact, right across from where we were sitting, there was a framed photo of Don and Stephen Colbert Don's work on the State Board of Education was so polarizing that it was the subject of a documentary that caught Stephen Colbert's attention. And in 2012, Don was featured on The Colbert Report. That's how I found out about him. Please welcome Don McLeroy. Uh, the atheist has the biggest problem. They have to have something come from nothing. I agree. I something little, cannot come from nothing. I teach my fourth grade Sunday school class what Jonathan Edwards described nothing is what a sleeping rock dreams of. Now, can you imagine writing a book about what a sleeping rock dreams of? So they have a problem. The atheist has a problem. The evolutionists already know, stated I they have a, a sleeping, problem. I know what a sleeping rock dreams of. Hot lava on lava action. Yeah. <laughs> Don was actually holding a rock while talking to Colbert. He still has that very same rock. He showed it to us when we visited him. So I'll tell you what I do with my fourth grade class. I take the same rock. I got permission from... Stephen Colbert, and I took this rock. This has been on the Colbert Report, national TV. I took that rock, and I said, this is what I teach my fourth graders. I said, I teach them that nothing is what a sleeping rock dreams of. Okay, here's how... Don McElroy teaches his Sunday school class about the problems with evolution, which he has every right to do. But while he was on the state board, he introduced his beliefs about science and almost every other subject taught in public schools into the Texas curriculum and thus, into textbooks everywhere. From Wonder Media Network, I'm Grace Lynch, and this is Teaching Texas, Episode 4. This week, how a creationist dentist led a conservative majority on the State Board of Education to transform the Texas curriculum. Even though Don McElroy's day job was dentistry, Politics and education were a priority for him. He told us that when his kids were little, he would put them to bed and then stay up late reading political philosophy. All of that reading and thinking led him to the belief that education was incredibly important. So he decided to run for school board. So I want y'all to look at this. I pulled this out just this morning. (laughs) When I first ran for school board, what's the date? Wow, 1997? 1997. 1997. Got elected to the, my local school board. This was the, the now flip it over. It's a photo of you and your family. Yes, yes. Two years after Don joined his local school board, he was elected to the state board of education. He became one of fifteen people setting education policy for students all across Texas. The first issue he set out to address was the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, also known as the TEKS. 
you got to know the history of the teaks. you got to know the history. The teaks are the standards that dictate what every student needs to know by the time they finish each subject in their grade level. But that's not where the impact of the teaks ends. Every year, students in Texas are given standardized tests designed to measure how well they know these standards. That means that the TEKS affect every part of the educational system in Texas. They impact teachers, who have to teach to the TEKS. They influence school districts, which are evaluated based on standardized testing results. And like I explained in the last episode, they matter to textbook publishers, who have to write to the TEKS to make sure that their textbooks are approved for use in Texas. The same textbooks that are being sold all across the country. In other words, the TEKS are very important. When Don joined the state board, he thought the TEKS were bad. They didn't build on each other. The standards for 7th graders were almost identical to the standards for 8th graders. It was awful. You should have a bunch of new standards each time that should build. That's what this Gene Shaw talks about, who was the lady that... Don uh, didn't like the TEKS. If he was the only one who'd felt that way... It might not have mattered. But lucky for Don, the conservative backlash to textbooks was in full swing right when he ran for state board. Opponents of the textbooks ran a pretty awful campaign to defeat as many of the Democrats as they could in the following election. That's Dan Quinn again, our fount of knowledge about obscure Texas school board politics. He told us about the campaign these conservatives ran to make it onto the board. So you would find flyers uh, on cars or sent to you in the mail that were just political pornography, really. I mean, one of them was a photograph of a black man and a white man, both shirtless, uh, holding hands. And uh, the caption was something like, you know, this is what that Democrat on the state board wants to teach your kids. Um, It wasn't lost on many people, by the way, that it was a black man and a white man. So there was some racism involved in this, as well as the homophobia that was involved in it. Uh, But it was effective. Those Democrats lost and Republicans took control of the board and social conservatives began their rise. By the time Don was elected to the board, he was joining a sizable block of conservative politicians. And I mean incredibly conservative. Dan Quinn told me some of these members were suspicious of the entire concept of public education. One of them in 2008 published a book in which she called public education the tool of perversion and said that parents who send their kids to public schools were throwing their kids into the flames of hell. This was somebody on the State Board of Education managing our public schools throughout the state. To make any changes in the TEKS, the board had to agree through a majority vote. That meant that if Don could get eight out of 15 members of the board to add something, anything, to the TEKS, it would go in. You know, on a personal level, Don is actually a, comes across as a very kind man. Uh, he doesn't come across as an angry fire breather. But when he's on the board, he comes across as a very rigid ideologue. Um, for the things that he believes in. I mean, there's no compromise. And he is the cause of a lot of the problems that we see in standards and in textbooks today in Texas. He was a big impetus behind passing a lot of that. Don got the most national attention for changing the way evolution was taught in Texas, which he did by revising the science teaks. But he had a hand in changing a lot of other teaks. Each revision he made led to real changes to how students learned that subject in school. And he was really proud of that fact. I'll now tell you my greatest achievement on the State Board of Education. I love to hear it. You want to hear my greatest achievement? It wasn't in the science, which was pretty good. It wasn't in the history, which I think was really good. It was in English. The year was 2007. At this point, Don had been on the Board of Education for just under 10 years. He had just been appointed chair by then-Governor Rick Perry and the board was working on adopting new English standards. Huge battle, huge battle. You had this English teacher coalition with all the English teachers. These are the ones that love to get into the, into the fray. There's, there's two groups of teachers. This is the one that uh, thought they had knew everything there was about English standards, and so they had their, their way. 
those English teachers drafted a version of the English teaks that they wanted to pass, which is exactly how you might imagine it would happen. The teachers are the ones with experience and pedagogical background. They really seem like the folks who should have a strong say in the situation. However, Don did not like their way. There was one line in particular he wanted gone. Compare themes in similar texts. So Don wrote a replacement. Identify moral lessons as themes in well-known fables, stories, legends, and myths. Don's standard passes. It was one line. Identify moral lessons as themes in well-known fables, stories, legends, and myths. Thirteen words. But that line meant that textbook publishers had to add new stories to their books. So one of the greatest things that happened after that was uh, a year or so later, we get the textbooks written on the standards. And this publisher came by my office right here. And guess what he tells me? He says, I want you to look at the stories we got in. The new textbooks had stories like The Boy Who Cried Wolf, Jack and the Beanstalk, and Cinderella. That was the publisher's interpretation of what Don meant when he said well-known stories. And then, in the classroom, teachers were expected to help their students identify moral lessons in each of these stories. I mean, if you're going to learn to read, read something that's got a moral lesson as themes, you know, moral lesson. Instead of kids learning how to analyze literature by comparing and contrasting stories, the focus became on them learning moral lessons from stories that Don thought were important. Just like the Gablers, Don believed that the classroom was a place for kids to learn morals. And by changing just 12 words in the English teaks through a simple majority vote, Don imposed that belief on classrooms across the state. This process of letting board members get the final say means that they can add things to the teaks that just aren't accurate. So by the time the teaks actually make their way to teachers across Texas, things can get confusing. I was having to teach the curriculum and I was finding all kinds of weird things in the curriculum. That's Sherry Matula. She was a Texas educator for 40 years. Sherry sometimes found teaching to the teaks to be difficult. Often, the standards contained blatant inaccuracies. The one that sticks out the most is continually calling the native, native-born native indigenous as Indians. And they still have it in the curriculum now in fourth grade, fifth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade. They still are calling them Indians. And of course, they're testing them that way. I'm just like... Sherry taught her class using the more accurate terms, native-born or indigenous. But on the day that her students would have to take the standardized tests, Sherry had to tell them... There are a number of things that you're going to encounter that you will be tested on that are incorrect. From Don's perspective, his TEKS revisions were really improving the lives of kids in these classrooms. Like the English TEKS, Don thought it was incredible that kids got the opportunity to learn these well-known stories, like Goldilocks and the Three Bears or Rumpelstiltskin. That's what all the children in Texas were exposed to because we got that standard in that says well-known. Isn't that exciting? I found that super exciting that these kids are getting, what do I want these kids to be challenged and and also... Can I I ask you a question about this, though? You say well-known is the exciting part here, but my question is well-known by whom? Well, society, us, we all grew up with it. Everybody, everybody knows what well-known. You can't find anybody in my generation that didn't get to read these. We read these to our children, and now these children would... The disadvantaged kids would never have seen these stories, likely, except for they were in their textbooks. I mean, if you're going to learn to read, read something that's got a moral... I loved Don's answer to that question. He's clearly never considered that there wasn't a straightforward answer to the question. Because for him, it is obvious. Us. Society. He means well-known to him. And people like him. White, middle-class, baby boomers, and their children. People who aren't like the disadvantaged kids Don is trying to help. When Don talks about these disadvantaged kids, I think he's talking about kids of color. He's worried that these kids might not know the stories he grew up with. 
but he's not considering that these kids might have a completely different set of stories that they consider well-known, and that those stories are just as valuable. During the two hours we spent with him, Don talked a lot about disadvantaged kids. As a dentist, he worked with a lot of kids who were on Medicaid. That's a big reason he decided to get into education, to help those kids. When he talked to us, a big idea he kept coming back to was this concept of imago dei. That's Latin for image of God. It's a Christian belief that everyone on this planet is created in the image of God. To Don, that means that every single kid is special and unique and important, even and especially the disadvantaged kids that he was trying to help by changing the Teak's standards. The concept of imago dei was so foundational to his beliefs that he put it on his campaign manifesto when he first ran for school board. And of course, he read it aloud for us. Bryan is a great town with fine people and outstanding potential. I pledge to work together with the families and schools of Bryan toward the goal of having children who will be successful in life. I will serve on the basis of the following fundamental beliefs. Each first one first bullet. Each child is special, being created in the image of God, and has the right to be treated fairly and to be challenged with high expectations of academic success. Imago Dei also informed Don's belief in creationism. Every child is special and unique because they are divinely created, in the Creator's image. God had to create everything. Otherwise, we'd all just be nothing more than cells put together in a random formation. I ask patients all the time, I still ask patients this all the time. I say, do you think you're just a collection of molecules and we like to enjoy having a conversation? And nobody says yes, that's what they think. I say, well, then why don't we teach it to our, our children that they're just, you know, it's, it's frankly wrong. You think about all this 14th Amendment and liberty that everybody's supposed to have, right? Well, why don't we have the liberty to teach our children? We don't think it's right, but we don't. But anyway, that, that's beside the point. So, just like with the English teaks, when it came time to revise the science standards, Don didn't hesitate to change them to suit what he thought was right. That's after a quick break. The day that Richard Nixon gave a speech about his dog, the time that a war broke out over a pig farm, the very first time that a district got gerrymandered. Check out this day in esoteric political history from Radiotopia. Short, fun episodes three times a week with surprising stories from our political past and how they connect to our current moment. It's one of my go-to podcasts for something informative, but also out of the box. There's one episode about how Nixon's attempt to revamp the Secret Service uniforms ended up clothing a rural marching band. Trust me, it's worth a listen. Listen to This Day and Esoteric Political History wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to the show. For decades, evangelical Christians in Texas were on a crusade to water down how evolution was taught, and Dan Quinn had been watching them closely. In the late 80s, Texas began to move towards standards-based education like everybody else in the country. And uh, the issue came up of how those standards would address evolution, and the compromise they landed on was students will learn about the strengths and weaknesses of scientific theories. Of course, the only theory they really were caring about was evolution. Well, when that passed, creationist groups around the country latched onto that. That became kind of the way to go in and undermine the teaching of evolution. So if a textbook came up for adoption and they didn't include the so-called weaknesses of evolution as defined by creationists, then their textbook had to be rejected, they argued. Students having to learn the strengths and weaknesses of evolution became a huge problem. It meant that in Texas, teachers were required to teach the weaknesses in evolutionary theory, leaving space for discussions about non-science-based intelligent design. It sort of communicated to them that, oh, there's weaknesses behind this scientific theory for which there's an overwhelming amount of scientific evidence. And that was the big thing that they wanted in there. But over time, it occurred to us, really, that the big thing was getting that strengths and weaknesses language out. The us that Dan Quinn is referring to are the people at Texas Freedom Network, or TFN. 
TFN was the same organization that mounted a campaign against Neil Fry's work. At the time, Dan was TFN's spokesperson. He helped them launch a campaign to remove the phrase strengths and weaknesses from the science teaks, a direct challenge to the state board's conservative members. The things they want to advocate for are creationism dressed up in a lab coat. Um, that, you know, there was this intelligent something. We're not saying it's God. This intelligent something poofed it all into existence. Uh, and, you know, there's evidence for that. Well, there is no evidence for that because that's faith. There's nothing wrong with faith. But you don't teach faith in a science classroom. You teach science in the science classroom. And that they didn't like. Even though evolution is technically a theory, it's the best and only theory scientists have for how we got here. So teaching kids in a science class that evolution has weaknesses on par with its strengths is just not great science education. TFN knew this. They started sending out press releases about the extremism in the board to get the word out. They met with Democrats and Republicans on the board and built a bipartisan coalition to take a stand against the language. But around the same time TFN was doing all this work, Don got sent a book in the mail. What evolution is, Ernst Mayer? See how wide and thick it is? Mm -hmm. See what somebody sent me this. The person who sent Don the book was a regular attendee at state board meetings. And he had gone through and meticulously underlined and highlighted it, pointing out all the flaws, Gabler style. The fact that someone had taken so much time to question evolution really struck Don. And then I'm at a meeting in early December, and I take this book with me. And uh, we're at a, one of those other education meetings you get to go to, and there's Gail Lowe and Barbara Cargill. Fellow board members and two of Don's best friends. And we were sitting on looking, I said, I got this book from this guy. I hadn't met him at the time. I met him when he came to the board meetings. I said, and I said, look at this. I said, he went through this much effort because he knew evolution wasn't true. He knew it wasn't true. And I know it's not true. I can tell you that right now. I'm convinced, okay? I guess I can't absolutely prove it, but I'm as as skeptic as you can get, okay? Anyway, but what's so interesting, I said, i got to make a standard. And this is Ernst Merritt. A lot of it is talking about stasis. If you look up the word stasis, have you ever heard of the word stasis? Despite Don's best efforts, the Texas Freedom Network convinced enough moderate conservatives to vote against him. Here's Dan Quinn. We built a coalition of Democrats and non-religious right conservative Republicans on the board who realized that this was a problem. And it was a very close vote, but we did succeed in finally striking by one, by a single vote, the strengths and weaknesses language in the standards. And that was in 2009. Don wasn't happy with all of that. Students were no longer required to learn about the strengths and weaknesses of evolution. So Don and his fellow conservatives were faced with a new challenge. How do you get students to learn about the supposed flaws in evolution if there's no standard telling them to evaluate strengths and weaknesses of evolution? Don came up with a solution with help from a fellow conservative board member named Cynthia Dunbar. Remember earlier when Dan was talking about the board member who said public education was a tool of perversion? Yeah, that was Cynthia Dunbar. Here is the first science standard that Don and Cynthia put up for approval. Analyze and evaluate. This is in the evolution section. Scientific explanations concerning sudden appearance, stasis, and sequential nature of groups in the fossil record. Three main patterns in the fossil record. If you're not steeped in creationist thinking, you probably don't know what he's talking about. Stasis, sudden appearance, and the sequential nature of groups in the fossil record are three supposed weaknesses in evolution. They're all scientifically problematic, but as an example, with stasis, creationists claim that since there are creatures today that have not noticeably changed from their ancient ancestors in the fossil record, evolution must not be happening. So instead of having students identify the weaknesses of evolutionary theory— Don has them analyze and evaluate stasis, which is a specific weakness he identified. There's nothing wrong with analyzing and evaluating per se, but having students analyze and evaluate 
specific creationist talking points means that they're wading deeper into the weeds of creationist thinking. It wasn't as broadly damaging as the strengths and weaknesses language, but it wasn't great. Still, the standard passed. The, the people were stunned. It passed. I made my little eloquent speech to, to get it. And everybody was shocked, okay? So I said, mission accomplished. I was so thrilled. So in the end, even though TFN fought really hard for changes in the standards, the final science teaks were more of a compromise between TFN and the board's conservative contingent. Dan still considers getting that strengths and weaknesses language out of the standards a huge win. And beyond that, TFN did something else. They succeeded in alerting the general public to what Don was doing on the State Board of Education. I think most people realized they were pretty fringe beliefs. I mean, even Republicans in his district had begun to realize, hmm, this guy's kind of a little bit out there. I mean, he had his own website where he... It was a strange thing. He seemed to promote the this heliocentric theory... But while he was on the board, he didn't have to be particularly persuasive to the general public. He only had to be persuasive to the religious right members and one extra Republican on the board, and he could win. And he won a lot. Soon after the science standards fight, the State Board of Education caught the attention of the Texas state legislature. State senators on both sides of the aisle were taken aback by how extreme the board had gotten. So they blocked Don from getting renominated as chair. Don didn't let that stop him. He turned to the next battle, social studies. TFN hired independent experts to review the social studies standards that Don and the state board passed. One of the experts they hired was David Brockman, the scholar of Christian nationalism you heard from last episode. So it was a real eye-opener for me when I looked at the social studies standards because I I found them to be heavily out of balance, heavily emphasizing Christianity over other religions and basically providing a kind of one-sidedly positive account of Christianity. Unsurprisingly, the same board that wanted kids to learn that a Christian God created the Earth and Science class also wanted kids to have a positive view of Christianity in social studies class. For example, they decided they wanted to include Moses as one of the people who influenced America's founding documents. The idea was, Moses wrote the Ten Commandments, and the Ten Commandments are reflected in the founding documents. That's how Moses gets in there. It's part of the Christian nationalist narrative that the the Constitution, the founding documents basically, are based on the Bible, and that's what the founders intended. And we've drifted away from that. We've drifted away from from the Bible, and we need to get back to the that original intent. There is no evidence that Moses had any influence on the founding documents. In fact, America's founders were fairly explicit that the American government and the American Constitution were not tied to any organized religion. But, of course, that didn't matter to the board. And unlike the science battle, it was really hard to beat Don on social studies. Man, when it came to social studies, it was the death of a thousand cuts. I mean, they just, it was one thing after another that they managed to get through. When it came to science, people on the board were willing to accept that they weren't experts. That wasn't the case for American history. Everybody thinks that what they know about American history is, that's factual. But a lot of what we learn outside of schools is kind of myth-making in some ways. Uh, It becomes easily politicized. Um, It's used to promote a particular agenda. Um, And I think when it came to the social studies standards, the Republicans that we worked with that voted with us on science reverted to form as Republicans. And it really didn't make any difference how many scholars, how many historians that we brought before the state board to testify that, you know, Moses really wasn't a major influence on the Constitution. Experts and scholars did try to fight back. But getting through to the board members was almost impossible. During one state board meeting, a scholar got up and told Pat Hardy, a conservative on the board, 
you can't keep the standard about Moses. It was a very amiable, friendly back and forth uh, in which the scholar was saying, really, you need to look at this. I don't know how teachers would teach this concept. It's nothing that scholars have looked at in the past. There's no scholarship to look at here. There's no way to to show parts of the Constitution that somehow derive from Moses. I mean, in what ways would you do this? This is really kind of a matter of faith uh, rather than as something that's based on facts. Pat Hardy just finally turned and said, I understand what you're saying. I just disagree. And that was it. With that, she had um, made clear her superiority in knowledge on the topic uh, because by God, it was based on what she had learned when she was younger and had learned and believed all of her life. And it didn't really make any difference what scholars were telling her. It's the same logic as forcing students to identify the morals of well-known myths. Don wanted kids to learn the myths that he learned when he was a kid. And in the same way, all the board's conservatives wanted kids in Texas to learn the myths about American history that they had been taught. Many of the board's conservative members were steeped in Christian nationalist thought. That meant that they believed that America's founding was divinely inspired. So to them, all stories about American history should always be grounded in one basic premise, that God had a hand in creating America. Believing that God had a hand in creating everything, humans, the earth, America, is what underpins all of Don's ideas. When we talked to Don, he referenced the first line of the Declaration of Independence as proof that we are a Christian nation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. The secular people, secular people want to argue that we're a secular state. Yes, I'll agree that. Yeah. Yeah. There's no religious test or anything. I We're a secular, secular state, but we're not founded on secular principles. The secular just says, well, there is no truth, there is no God, and that we just evolved. But our Constitution, I mean, our Declaration, the founding document, the one that got the clock started, the clock started ticking in our country, asserts there's truth, that we're created, and there's a creator. Those are biblical principles. Don thinks secularists believe in nothing or what a sleeping rock dreams of. And I think his desire to push back against all of that nothing is what's animated a lot of the changes he made to the Texas Teaks. For what it's worth, subscribing to secular thought doesn't mean you believe in nothing. There are foundational truths, like equality, justice, and tolerance, that you can aspire to without having to believe in God. Don didn't see it that way. He continued changing the teaks to reflect what he believed in until 2010, when he lost his re-election campaign to a more moderate opponent, Thomas Ratliff. Even after he lost, Don kept attending board meetings, this time as a private citizen, getting up to make public comment about the teaks. Say what you will about Don, but it's clear he genuinely cares about public education and the people who are involved in shaping it, whether those people are with him or against him. I, I, I've never burned a bridge with anybody, and I'm not about to, okay? I like these guys. The very same year TFN was eviscerating Don for his stance on evolution, he sent Dan Quinn, their spokesperson, a Christmas card. That's a refreshing attitude for someone involved in politics to hold, and it's a far cry from the political ethos we typically see today. Right now, it's not uncommon for school board meetings to feature shouting parents, all demanding that their kids stop learning critical race theory. Even though these parents aren't as neighborly or cheerful as Dawn, their ideologies can be traced right back to the same set of Christian nationalist beliefs. And things like structural racism are hard to square with the idea of a divinely founded nation. It's undeniable that slavery and racism were bound up with the founding. And I think the Christian nationalism doesn't often come up explicitly in the CRT debate. But I think part of the revulsion on the part of um, anti-CRT people to these ideas is that it, in a way, it undermines the idea of a divine founding. 
Critical race theory teaches that the institution of slavery was a fundamental part of America's founding. That is antithetical to Christian nationalist thought. To them, enslavement was a personal sin, a few bad apples in the divine bushel. Naming slavery as a crucial component in the country's origin story makes America itself a sinful nation. And if you're a Christian nationalist and someone tells you that the nation you believe is divinely founded is actually a nation built on sin, you might just find yourself at a school board meeting fighting to keep your beliefs alive. We were told many, many times by the K-12 cartel that uh, CRT wasn't being taught in schools. Um, In fact, we have found that it is being taught in schools. They told us it's a graduate level course. It is a graduate level course, and we believe that it belongs just there in graduate school. Next week on Teaching Texas, how the CRT debate became the new frontier of the education wars. Teaching Texas is a Wonder Media Network production. To get episodes early, make sure to subscribe to WMN Politics Plus on Apple Podcasts. If you can, please rate and review the show or share it with a friend to help our audience grow. Teaching Texas is created by me, Grace Lynch. It's produced by myself and Adeswa Agbenile. Our editor is Lindsay Cradwell. Production assistance by Sarah Schleed. Jenny Kaplan is our executive producer. Original theme music by Chelsea Daniel. Mind Shift is back with Season 7. I'm Ki Sung. And I'm Nima Gobier. We've been cooking up the next season of Mind Shift where we keep bringing you the future of learning. This summer, we're talking about EdTech. I would say that these systems are mechanisms of control. Changes that we might see sweeping the nation. The typical pattern has been that it all works out and everyone's happier. And crushes. And then he would have like, he would have like high white socks and then would wear shorts. And he had short spiky hair. The new season of Mind Shift starts July 19th. 